Hey, good morning. I just wanted to spend a few moments and address you as you head into your second weekend of unprecedented opportunity at your local church in the middle of all of the changes and all of the things that are going on in our society. I know that uh, as I talk to some pastors, there's some real issues at work. There's some real fear at work, and there's some real adjusting that's going on at work. And I wanted to spend a few minutes and talk to you today about the topic of fear and how to lead when you're feeling those twinges of fear inside yourself. The Bible addresses fear so many times because, well, it's a reality. We get into situations where we feel afraid. The difference for the pastor, the difference for the lay leader, the difference for the board member, the difference for those of us that are in leadership is while we're feeling the fear, we still have leadership responsibilities. So I want to talk to you about that. See, it's not enough to read on Facebook, don't be afraid. (laughs) Sometimes it's not enough to have somebody tell you, you are a man of faith, you shouldn't be feeling fear. When you're feeling the fear, it still needs to be dealt with in a constructive way. When I was learning how to drive, my dad took me into the garage and he said to me, "Uh, today you're going to learn how to change a tire. I said, I don't need to learn how to change a tire. All my tires are fine. He said, someday they're not going to be fine and you're going to need to know how to do it. And so he gave me a tutorial on how to change a tire. Little did I understand that when I was a young married, I'd be changing one bald tire for another on a regular basis on my cars. But my dad taught me how to be prepared for something even before I needed it. Today, I just want to talk to you about how to lead when you're feeling those twinges of fear. Fear is a reality. It's a reality in your congregation. It's a reality in society. It was certainly a reality when Valerie took me to Sam's Club last Friday. You could feel fear just barely under the surface with all of the people that were hoarding as much as they could possibly get into their shopping carts. I want to remind you that the Bible addresses fear through lots and lots of its characters. Lots of its leaders felt fear. Some of them did well, some of them didn't do well. Moses was on the backside of a wilderness and he was watching his father-in-law's sheep. He was hiding out and God showed up and talked to him and commandeered him and redirected him. And Moses objected because he was afraid to leave surroundings that had become very comfortable to him. The 10 scouts went in and looked at a land that was a land flowing with milk and honey. They brought back grapes the size of basketballs and said, yes, this is a great land, but we can't do it. They saw potential, but they were afraid. As a matter of fact, they were afraid of the potential that was in front of them. Jonah, he was just afraid of people. He was afraid of the Ninevites, and for that reason, he ran away from God and tried to hide in a place called Tarsus. He never quite made it, but he wanted to get away from the command of God and the leading of God because he was afraid of people. Then there was a rich young ruler who was afraid of sacrificing that which he had. And then there was John Mark who had kind of a difficulty on missions trips, and he was afraid of the unknown And there was David in 1 Samuel chapter 30 who was afraid of his friends because they were so distraught they were talking about stoning him. The person that we think about in Scripture the least when it comes to this topic of fear is the one who teaches us the greatest lessons on how to deal with fear when we are in leadership and we're feeling twangs of fear. Jesus himself had days where he experienced some fear. It says this in Matthew 26, when Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. When he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, feeling afraid in the garden. Jesus, struggling with the will of God. Jesus, struggling with the events of a following day. Jesus, struggling in his own humanity with the will that God had for him. From Jesus, we're going to learn some pretty important lessons on how to lead when you're feeling fear crowding in. The first thing that we learn from Jesus in this passage that I read 
is that you get together with trusted people. Fear usually uh, causes us to isolate in some capacity. And fear is dissipated when we get with other people who say the right things and do the right things and live the right kind of lives and have the right kind of outlook. There are uh, a great reminder here, there's a great reminder here that we're not designed to do the will of God in isolation. Jesus took people with him. He took Peter and James and John and said, I need you to be with me right now. Fear breeds in isolation, in our own thoughts, in our own what-if scenarios. The first thing, if you're going to lead well when you start feeling fear, is you make sure the right voices are speaking to you and that the wrong voices don't have an opportunity to speak to you. The second thing we learn from Jesus in this passage is that, that fear always dissipates in the presence of God relationship and connection, understanding that the crowd doesn't always hold the answers and that sometimes we have to separate ourselves from the crowd and the crowd mentality and we need to get together alone with God and spend time with God and hear from God and God's voice has the ability to calm the fears of our lives immediately. It's amazing how often Jesus could find time in a busy schedule to just get quiet and to just get alone. When I spend time quietly with God, me and God, the most amazing thing happens in my fear-based moments is that my problems become smaller and God becomes bigger. Pastor, when the problems of society, the problems of church, the problems of life become bigger than God in your life, you're out of business because you have nothing left to offer. Jesus shows us that when you're afraid, one of the things that must happen is you must find some time alone with God. And the third thing we see here in the life of Christ is remember that God has a will that is never altered, never changed, and never set to the side because of difficulty of circumstance. God has a will. And all through the 139th chapter of the book of Psalms, there is a reminder after reminder after reminder of the fact that God's will is being worked. Remember that God has a plan, that God has a will. And then, my friend, submit to the will of God and the plan of God. And it is amazing what happens that in our submission to God's will, what that does to feelings of fear. Jesus goes into the garden and he takes three of his friends a little further, and then he pushes on to a moment of solitary prayer with God, and he falls to the ground and he says, can we change the plan? Is there a B plan? Is there any way I can get out of having to drink this cup? Don't miss the struggle. Don't miss the humanity of Christ. Don't miss the skin portion of Jesus. His humanity is on full display. He's worried and he's afraid. He's pushing against God's plan in fear. Do you know that any time we push against God's plan for us, God's will for us, it intensifies our fear. Rebellion in your life never leads to peace. When afraid, submit to God. When afraid, find out what God's will is and what he said to you last and submit holy to what it is that God's called you to do. The fourth thing that we see is when you're suffering with some feelings of fear, don't let disappointment in other people stop you from moving ahead. Look at verse 40 in Matthew 26. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, 
He again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to pray with him. They don't. They sleep. The burden of the world's sin is not on them, and so they sleep. When I lose sleep at night over the concern of a district, over the concern of a church, over the concern of a pastor. Recently, my grandson spent the night with me, Monday night, and it was a restless night for me, but both of them slept very well. Does that mean that they don't love me? No, it just means that the burden isn't on them the way it's on me. The disciples loved Christ, they followed Christ, they served Christ, they loved him completely and intensely, but the burden was his to bear. It wasn't that the people in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane intended to disappoint Jesus, it's just they didn't have the same burden. The disciples loved him, they served him, they followed him. This they could not do. Even if they had prayed, their prayers would not have been as passionate as the prayers of Christ. Jesus lets them sleep. He continues to work things out with God, and his prayer ends in a declaration. You see, the battle for Jesus is going to be won on his face in the garden long before he wins the battle of a mock trial, a scourging, or a cross. And the last thing I want to share with you about leading with fear from the life of Christ is that absence of fear is what enables you to lead people into action. While fear is immobilizing, fear's absence gives you permission to act. It says this in verse 45 of that same chapter. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Look, the hour is near. There's my betrayer. Get up. Let's go. It's a call to battle. From sorrow and death and being overwhelmed to leading his men into the battle of the day and him taking responsibility for the sin of the world. From let this cup pass to let's get after the events of today. From isolation and falling on the ground to standing his ground in front of a mob led by Judas. From fear and sweating blood to demonstrating enough courage to allow Judas to kiss him on the cheek. The change in Jesus is clearly seen by what he says and how he acts. Time alone with God has made a magnificent shift in Christ. Time alone with God has altered him. His solitude with God has made it possible for him to victoriously lead the events of the following day. All of the struggles of Christ and the cross and the, the scourging and the mockery, all of these things are well documented in Scripture. Sometimes what we miss is what Jesus says and what he doesn't say. Look again at the story. Look at his strength. Look at his resolve. The Jesus in fear and worry is gone and now is a man of strength and resolve. Leading his disciples, embracing the plan of God, and drinking the cup completely. The time in the garden, the time in prayer, the battle, all serves to show us what happens when we pray. We get stronger. Jesus prays. No more tears, no more fear, no more desperation. Not in the arrest, not at the trial, not during the scourging, not while on the cross, not as he dies. He dealt with it in the garden. My friend, that's what happens when you're afraid and you pray and you get along with God. It doesn't change the circumstances. It changes you. And God uses you to change the circumstances. God didn't change any of the circumstances for Christ, but Christ altered into a position of strength. And praise God, praise God, praise God, because today we have one who stands between us and the Father and has provided a gateway for us to have relationship with the Holy God. 
Praise God that Jesus, when he was afraid, dealt with his fear in such a, an outstandingly effective way. My friend, no one will fault you for feeling afraid during unparalleled times. But your people need you. Your community needs you. We need you. I would ask you to take from the example of Christ, to be alone with God, to let God alter you just enough to be effective this day and tomorrow as you address your congregation and as you address the needs of your community. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for my friends across the Northern California and Nevada District. Thank you, God, that you have seen fit to put each of them in roles of responsibility in times like this. Thank you, God, for trusting each of them with such wonderful opportunity for your kingdom. God, I pray for their strength. I pray for their resolute ability to be able to stand and lead and speak hope and speak faith and speak direction in the face of people who definitely need all of those things. Bless them and keep them. Use them to the full for your glory, for your honor, and for the expansion of your kingdom during this time. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you, friends. Lead them well.